All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. Madam Secretary, would you please call the roll? Assemblywoman Anderson? Present. Assemblywoman Black? Here. Assemblywoman Brown May? Here. Assemblywoman Carlton? Here. Assemblywoman Cohen? Here. Assemblyman Ellison? Present. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Here. Assemblywoman Hansen? Assemblywoman Martinez? Present. Assemblywoman Titus? Here. Assemblyman Wheeler? Here. Chair Watts? And I am here. Thank you. I think all members present. We've got a quorum. Uh, with that, before we get the meeting started, I'll go through a few quick housekeeping announcements as I usually do. Uh, members, please remember to place yourselves on mute uh, when you're not speaking. Uh, so that we can minimize background noise. For members of the public, you can participate in our meetings in a variety of ways. Information on how to do so can be found on every meeting agenda for this committee, as well as on the help page at the Nevada Legislature's website. Uh, participants must register in advance to provide uh, testimony or public comment. They can also submit opinion polls online. Written comments can also be emailed to our committee email address before, during, or up to 48 hours after the meeting. Committee exhibits and amendments must be submitted electronically in PDF form to our committee manager no later than 4 p.m. the day prior to our meeting. Amendments must include a bill number, statement of intent, and contact information. All submitted exhibits can be found on the Nevada Legislature's website. Uh, we ask when providing comment or testimony that you limit your remarks to two minutes so that we can accommodate all speakers and get through our meeting in a timely manner. Uh, and with that, uh, I believe we can move on. Uh, the other item uh, will be we're going to start with our work session. So just remember, members, to please provide uh, your name when making a motion or second. Uh, and then we'll use yes or no when conducting our roll call votes. Uh, as previously mentioned, we do not take testimony during our work session. However, we may ask the sponsors to clarify any questions that might come up. So with that, uh, we'll begin our work session with Assembly Bill 6. Mr. Stinnisbeck, our policy analyst, will walk us through the work session document. Please go ahead when you're ready, sir. Thank you, Chair. For the record, Jan Stinnisbeck with the Research Division of the LCB. As nonpartisan staff, I cannot advocate for or against any measures to come before this committee. Uh, with that, Assembly Bill 6 uh, was heard in this committee on March 1st. Uh, it makes uh, the holding of a hearing on application uh, for a temporary change to the place of diversion, manner of use, or place of use of water already appropriate to be at the discretion of the state engineer. Uh, there was one amendment to the bill that was proposed by this committee and makes the following change. It provides that the procedures for a protest application apply to a protest filed by an interest person against the granting of a temporary application. And the, the language to this proposed amendment is also attached to a work session uh, document. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stenisbeck. Are there any questions uh, about the proposed amendment? I see we have one from Assemblywoman Hansen. Please go ahead. I just wanted to clarify, temporary applications are only good for a year, is that right? Thank you for the question, Assemblyman Hanson. That is correct. Um, it, if you'd like, we can have the agency uh, clarify that, but yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Any other questions on the amendment? Yes, Assemblywoman Titus, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that was my... Um, concern over this bill is that there was seemed like no process if someone didn't agree uh, uh, about the denial. And so what this says is that it refers back to the process 
under 533.365, but it doesn't say, um, it doesn't say that the engineer, I guess, I just need assurance that the, the person then, they file a protest, they get to have a, a hearing if they don't agree with his denial. Is that correct? So that there is due process here? Thank you very much for the question. And I'm going to have the state engineer um, come on to answer as well. But uh, I do want to say that we, we had some conversations about this and wanted to get some clarity around uh, some of the, the ways that they already practice and making sure that the statute lines up. So the the in, our understanding is that this amendment basically makes the uh, a permanent application and a temporary application follow the same process. The only difference is for a truly um, minor issue uh, where it's again temporary and it's determined to have no potential impact to a water right or the public interest, you can have, you can skip the noticing provision. So if there's even a potential possibility that there's a conflict, it has to be noticed just like any all permit um, applications do. And then after it's noticed, a protest can be filed. Uh, and then the state engineer can choose whether or not to hold a hearing before issuing a decision. And that decision could be to uh, approve or deny <laughs> an application. Uh, and then I'll, if somebody from the Division of Water Resources come on if, if there's anything that uh, uh, needs to be clarified or added to that, as well as Mr. Amber, and if I misspoke in any way. Thank you, Assemblyman Watts. Uh, this is Adam Sullivan for the record. Um, and I agree with your characterization that um, the, the intent here is to be clear with, to make it clear that um, 533.345, dealing with one year temporary applications, sets forward a path for due process that is the same as any other application filed before the Ford in, before the state engineer. And if the applicant disagrees with the outcome, with the decision, there's still a pathway for appeal, um, just like any other application. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much for that clarification, Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Amburn, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Not at this time, Chair, unless other questions come up. Thank you. Does that address your question, Assemblywoman? Well, then, th thank you. It seems like then rereading it, then it's totally, I'm not sure that there's a need for the bill then because it puts it back to what it really was before. So that's, I guess that's what I'm looking at. Sometimes these one page bills are really the hardest ones to, to wrap around. You think it should be so simple. But then if you're adding that ba language back in, then I, I guess, I'm not sure the bill really does do anything. It looks like um, the only question was the hearing. In the past, it was mandated that they hold a hearing. And I guess maybe that's the difference. There's no mandate. Um, now that only if they protest, there's going to be the hearing. Is that the clarification then? I'll, I'll let Mr. Amburn provide some clarification on this. Thank you, Chair Watts. Alan Amburn for the record. So Assemblywoman, the way that the process used to work under the language for the temporary application was that uh, the state engineer shall give notice of an application pursuant to the notice requirement and statute and the state engineer has to hold a hearing. Right. Um, and so what this bill is doing is now deferring to the process set forth in statute. And what that statute says is that um, if they protest His oh, mic went out. We lost your audio, Mr. Amber. From, from if they protest. <laughs> now, uh, your mic is on your headset. Can you hear me? Yes. So sorry about that. Um, so basically, now that we're referring to existing statute, the state engineer has to consider the protest and then may hold a hearing on that protest, but he or she is not required to hold a hearing. So that is okay. the major distinction that's occurring. So it's now mirroring the existing statute for permanent 
applications and temporary applications. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I know that the, this change is a little counterintuitive, so wanted to make sure that we got all got the record clear that it this achieves the goal that the state engineer's office looked for when they brought the bill, as well as add additional clarity about the protest process and really trying to line up uh, the two processes. So thank you for that question. Are there any other questions uh, about the amendment? All right, seeing none, I would accept a motion to amend and do pass Assembly Bill 6. Move to amend and do pass, Cohen. Thank you, I have a motion from Vice Chair Cohen. Do I have a second? Second, Assemblywoman Martinez. Thank you, I've got a second from Assemblywoman Martinez. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, will the secretary please conduct a roll call vote? Assemblywoman Anderson? Yes. Assemblywoman Black? Yes. Assemblywoman Brown May? Yes. Assemblywoman Carlton? Yes. Assemblywoman Cohen? Yes. Assemblyman Ellison? Yes. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Yes. Assemblywoman Hansen? Yes. Assemblywoman Martinez? Yes. Assemblywoman Titus? Yes. Assemblyman Wheeler? Yes. Chair Watts? Yes. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. And let's see. I will assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Brown May. Uh, with that, let's move on to the next item for work session, which is AB84. Mr. Stinnisbeck, will you please lead us through the work session document for this bill? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, again, for the record, again, Mr. Stinnisbeck, um, Assembly by 84 was heard in this committee on March 24th, and it authorized the state forest or fire warden with certain approval to enter into certain public private partnerships for the purpose of addressing the threat of uh, wildfires. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions on this bill? Seeing none, I'd accept a motion to do pass Assembly Bill 84. Uh, move to uh, do pass, Cohen. Thank you. I've got a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton, or from Vice Chair Cohen. Do I have a second? Second, Brown May. Thank you. I've got a second from Assemblywoman Brown May. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I'd ask the secretary to please conduct a roll call vote. Assemblywoman Anderson? Yes. Assemblywoman Black? Yes. Assemblywoman Brown May? Yes. Assemblywoman Carlton? Yes. Assemblywoman Cohen? Yes. Assemblyman Ellison? Assemblywoman, yes. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Yes. Assemblywoman Hansen? Yes. Assemblywoman Martinez? Yes. Assemblywoman Titus? Yes. Assemblyman Wheeler? Yes. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Yes. Chair Watts? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That motion also carries unanimously. I will assign the floor statement for Assembly Bill 84 to Vice Chair Cohen. With that, we'll move on to the last item for work session, which is Assembly Joint Resolution Number 2. Mr. Stenisbeck, will you please lead us through the work session document for this resolution? Uh, thank you, Chair. For the record, again, Sinispec, 
Um, Assembly Joint Resolution 2 uh, was heard in this committee on the March 24th. Uh, the measure uh, recognized that forest health and uh, water quality are inextricably uh, linked. And uh, the measure also expresses support for various stakeholders to work together to identify watersheds that can be improved by better forest health measures. There were two amendments proposed um, to the resolution. Uh, the first by Nature Conservancy, uh, which adds language concerning the quantity of water, the effects of climate change, wildfire threats, and economic development. Uh, the second amendment was proposed by uh, Eureka County and adds language concerning rangeland and soil health and further encourages collaboration with conservation districts, land managers, uh, you know, private landowners, and land users. Uh, and both of those amendments and language are also attached to the work session document. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Spinnisbeck. Are there any questions from members on this resolution? All right, hearing none, we'll uh, uh, move in a little bit ahead of myself. I would accept a motion to amend and do pass assembly joint resolution two. Move to amend and do pass, Cohen. Thank you, I have a motion from Vice Chair Cohen. Do I have a second? Anderson, second. Thank you. I have a second from Assemblywoman Anderson. Is there any discussion on the motion? Now, nah, hearing none. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm going to be a yes in committee. Um, I'm kind of I'm not a fan of one amendment, <laughs> but I'm a fan of this other amendment. Um, I appreciate Eureka County. Um, amendment that encourages collaboration with conservation districts, land managers, private landowners, and land users. That should be consistent policy when we're dealing with, with range of land and water issues. So um, that amendment is getting me there. Um, so yes, in committee, and but reserving my right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Any other discussion on the motion? Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Assemblywoman Titus. Thank you. Unfortunately, um, I again, I'm similar to uh, Assemblywoman Hansen's concern about this, and I definitely appreciate you accepting what Eureka County had to offer and making sure range land, but there's other significant components of this bill that I cannot accept, so thank you. It will be a Thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, and, and we didn't know that this was going to be a problem until just about two minutes ago, so what I'm going to do is I'm still going to vote yes right now and, and I'm going to reserve my rights and I'm sure the other two are going to do that also because I haven't seen that other amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblyman Ellison. And just to be clear, both of these amendments were presented during the hearing. So if you do have any additional questions or concerns, please let the sponsors of the bill know um, prior to the measure coming up for a floor vote. I appreciate the remarks. Are there any any other discussion on this motion? Uh, if I may, Mr. Chair. So, Owen Anderson. I really appreciate the use of the word quantity and quality and not just quality. And so I just wanted to bring that up. I don't believe I brought it up during the hearing itself, but adding in quantity is an, an item of importance. Um, I really appreciate it with that amendment. So just wanted to point that out as well. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none. I'll ask the secretary to please conduct a roll call vote. Assemblywoman Anderson? Yes. Assemblywoman Black? No. Assemblywoman Brown May? Yes. Assemblywoman Carlton? Yes. Assemblywoman Cohen? Yes. Assemblyman Ellison? Yes. Assemblywoman Gonzalez? Yes. Assemblywoman Hansen? Yes. Assemblywoman Martinez? Yes. Assemblywoman Titus? No. Assemblyman Wheeler? No. Chair Watts? And I am a yes. Thank you. The motion does carry. And I will assign that floor statement to Assemblywoman Anderson. 
Thank you, I'll be honored. Thank you. That concludes our work session members. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to our bill hearings today. We have two bills on the agenda and I will be taking them out of order. We'll start with Assembly Bill 299. So I will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 299, which makes various changes relating to wildlife. I'll welcome Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod back to the Committee on Natural Resources. It's good to have you back here. Uh, whenever you are ready, please introduce yourself for the record and you may proceed. Thank you, Chair Watts and members of the Natural Resources Committee. It's great to be back. I loved this committee and I'm sad I'm not serving on it anymore. For the record, I'm Shannon Bilbray Axrod representing Assembly District 34 in Clark County. I am pleased to be presenting AB 299 to your committee today. AB 299 is a bill to prevent the waste of edible portions of our state's wildlife accidentally struck by vehicles. Currently, the ability to salvage game species is limited by state law. Our state Department of Wildlife and Department of Transportation have been making great progress in reducing wildlife vehicle collisions, but sadly, they still do happen from time to time. This bill will allow a process to use these animals in these situations. The bill sets up a permit process to be able to salvage a game animal that has accidentally been struck by a vehicle. Anyone who is seeking to salvage an animal must seek a permit. They would be able to get this permit either from an officer at the scene of an accident, from a physical office, or in certain circumstances online. The bill has a number of safeguards, including one, a person salvaging an animal would be hired to turn in the head, hide, antlers, horn, and tusk to end out if applicable. Uh, number two, any person who in, that intentionally kills an animal would be guilty of a category E felony, the same penalty as poaching. Number three, provisions for when a driver cripples an animal and the need to kill it humanely. Number four, provisions to allow NDOT to inspect the animal. In conversation with NDOT, we have proposed the following changes in a conceptual amendment that you should have on Nellis. The amendment makes three changes. It clarifies that if a person seeking a salvage per permit should seek that permit, they should seek that permit as soon as possible, but no later than 24 hours after taking possession. This 24 hour provision is intended when the animal is hit in a rural area and it's not feasible for a peace officer or endow to immediately respond. Number two, it clarifies that a person should not attempt to salvage an animal outside daylight hours without a peace officer present. And thirdly, a section, uh, adds a section to limit wildlife salvage to highways um, under 75 miles per hour and prohibits salvage on interstate highways. Finally, I would note that this will bring us into conformance with all other states around us. Sadly, wildlife vehicle collisions happen in our Western state and they're just a fact of life. Our neighbors have figured out a process to avoid waste for the edible portions. This bill will allow Nevada to do the same. Chair Watts, I would now like to turn it over to my colleague and primary co-sponsor, Dr. Titus, for her comments. Thank you, Assemblywoman, for allowing me to be a co-sponsor. And thank you, Chair, for hearing this bill. I was very excited when the good Assemblywoman asked me to co-sponsor this bill, living in the rural areas and being a hunter. Um, I saw both the benefits and also the concerns that folks had with um, the waste of animals. And, and days in the past, if someone ran over a deer or a, a something happened on the road and uh, the crews would come out and take it, they could salvage it and take it to say a, a, say a, a, a needy home or somebody that was hungry. There was a process. Recently, um, 20 different states, we now have 20 states in this nation that have, as the Assemblywoman mentioned, have passed this law, including our neighboring California and all of the states that surround us have, have this law. Uh, Nevada is one of the last holdouts on this law. Um, again, as she stated, we, we did have some safety concerns and perhaps NDOT will be on this call about uh, making sure that folks didn't do it in the middle of the road, folks didn't have this happen or intentionally run into an animal. Um, but it actually makes good sense if, if it's an edible uh, uh, animal that, uh, and different people may choose different things to eat. But 
um, doing it safely uh, it just made good sense and um, in a proper way to do this. And so putting it, making it uh, legal with safety um, and happy to have uh, and to help answer any questions as folks may have. Thank you very much. Uh, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod, are there any other presenters that you have for the bill? I am not seeing anybody else on. So, nope, we will open ourselves up for questions. Oh, no, I lied. I just saw David Richter's name. I didn't know, David, if you wanted to, to say anything or are you just gonna open yourself up for questions? Chair Watts, uh, thank you. Uh, and Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod, I'll just take it for questions. I, no further comment necessary, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, hard, hard with the presentation. Uh, with that, we can open it up for questions. I believe we can start with Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I happen to be one of them unfortunate ones that uh, actually totaled two cars on I-80 in one year and then uh, hit an antelope up in Ruby Valley. And, and it was a shame because uh, I asked the high patrol at that time if there was anyone that could salvage the animal. Uh, they were deer off the side of the road. And, and every time I'd go by, that carcass had been on duty, like out in rural area, like Ruby Valley, like when I hit the, the antelope, because uh, its hips were broken. And I called that in, but I noticed it is, as uh, when you're looking through this, it seems like to me to be a Not for any reason to salvage the animal. And, and second, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Allison. Yeah, uh, when we called in, you know, of course, it, you know, they were both pretty bad wrecks. But when we called in, we asked the high patrol that used to be that the uh, senior citizens uh, facility used to love to, to, to get the deer and uh, or antelope or whatever it was at the time. So uh, that was a high patrol that said no, but uh, I didn't think to call Endow or any of them. So that's that's well, good information. I learned something. Then. Well, so. Mr. Ellison, and they they would not have been allowed to, but with this bill, they will be able to. So yeah, it sounds good. It sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I support this bill 100. percent Thank you. Thank you both. I believe next we have a question from Vice Chair Cohen. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for the presentation. I'm I'm kind of wondering what happens if a um, if a officer, so the an officer can, um, you know, kind of help out, and and if someone hits um, an animal, you know, we'll have the forms possibly. Um, but what happens if the officer sees that the animal should not is not good for human consumption? It was old and ill. Um, even though there's supposed to be a really quick turnaround on this, it's you know Southern Nevada and it's summer. Can the officer do anything to keep the person from taking this um, uh, uh, maybe carcass that would not be good for humans to even be around, uh, let alone eat? I'm going to toss that one over to Assemblywoman Titus or Mr. Richter because I don't know the answer to that. Well, well I'll start. Certainly. Um, with, with the officer involved and if he's involved, um, I think it's going to be, it, it's an immediate effect. I mean, if this, this animal is dead, it's not something that you can find a dead animal five days later and want to salvage that meat. Uh, I, I'm a hunter. I love game and I could certainly quarter out an animal on the side of the road if I, if I had to and had the opportunity and would. But at the same time, you know, if they're maggot laden, you probably, it might tenderize them, but it's not something you really probably want to take home. So I don't think that that would be an issue. Although I would say that if the animal was in the middle of the road and, and was sick and, and that's why it was still there and appeared ill, I, I don't believe the person that would want to harvest it. There's a little bit of, of knowledge there. Um, however, that's where the peace officer comes in also and having that salvage permit and the understandable knowledge. Um, I, I think it's going to be up to the officer to determine whether it looks like it was you know, uh, hit on purpose because that's one of the things we don't want to have happen. You see a deer and you go, oh my goodness, you know, you could you can bump it, break its leg, shoot it, and take it. We, we want to avoid those issues, but there's nothing to say, you know, these deaths already happen. We want to make sure that meat is used and, and comment. There's 
have to involve some common sense here that um, if it's a rotten thing and the birds are already hanging on it, it's not something that was just hit. So um, th there's going to be those issues. Thank you. Uh, Assemblywoman Hanson, did you have a question? No, okay. Uh, I believe next we have Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair Watts, and thank you, uh, Assemblymember Bill Bray Axelrod and Assemblymember Titus for bringing uh, this forward. I just actually had a friend who was experienced something like this. I think it was in Montana just a few weeks ago. Um, very quick question uh, because I. I'm not a hunter and I do not understand all of this information. Under section one, uh, subsection three C, so it's basically page three, lines 27 through 30. The turning in of the um, head, hide, antlers, horns, and tusk, would that be a decision at the, de at the department level or would that be a decision of the officer, the, the officer who is on the scene to make those decisions? Or is that something that has to have a lot lengthier discussion with the department? I'm gonna take that because I know the answer because I was on natural resources before. Um, <laughs> there are certain animals that carry diseases and we need to make sure that they don't have them. So they are actually written into statute on which animals need to be kept. Do you wanna add anything Assemblyman Titus? Yeah, um, so what she's referring to is certain elk with chronic wasting disease, and, and uh, we want to make sure that there's no part of the horns. But one of the issues here is you know, there are hunters who hunt for horns, and if you see a nice set of horns over there, you know, we, we don't want you to be able to go and snag those, and they have to be turned over appropriately. So this is not about the collection of either, you know, if you hit a, you know, um, a, uh, antelope and you're going out for the horns or you hit a deer or you hit an elk and that's why you're stopping. The purpose of this is to salvage edible products. And so we didn't want to make it, oh, you know, you, you can put that on your wall as a deadhead. That's not what this is about. Although I have some in my office, I legitimately shot those and I ate those. But the reality for this bill is really about being sensible about meat and, and a meat that actually is healthy for you, regardless of the fact that it might have been hit by a car. Um, so we did not want to turn this into in any way, somebody out there searching for antlers or somebody out there searching for these horns. And so it's really important. And then as, as she pointed out, as some women, Barbara Ashrod pointed out, there are some diseases that are, you know, we really are searching for. And then, and they can also, and Dal can also do some research on them and, and know the age of the, of the horn. And then to vice chair's point, if this animal is diseased, anything of that nature, that hide and those antlers and those horns are really important. Thank you so much. Thank you for the clarification. And thank you, Chair Watts, for allowing me the time for those questions. Thank you for that question. I believe we have one from Assemblyman Wheeler. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it was kind of partially answered. Um, but uh, Assemblywoman, I just made a comment that got me thinking. Uh, is there any kind of time limit on when you have to take this uh, animal and butcher it? Because you can't take head, horns, hide, et cetera, uh, trophies. So how, you know, if someone sticks it in a storage locker for a week or two, how do they know whether he's taken the head, horn, hide, or trophy? Uh, Assemblywoman Titus said she could quarter it on the side of the road. I don't think they're going to want to do that when they issue the permit. <laughs> so uh, if that could, you could explain that, I'd appreciate it. Well, certainly, if I might... So, I mean, definitely different types of um, animals can be harvested and cut up um, without any hanging of the animal. Some can be just quartered out and, and literally on an antelope, we don't, we chill it down as quick as possible and you cut it up as quick as possible. Deer, you do hang for five to seven days, elk will hang that long. But the purpose of that was is that you have up to five days, according to this, within five business days after taking possession of the animal, uh, you have to salvage salvage animal, you have to turn it into the department. So if you are out in the middle of nowhere, if you are wherever, and you do hang the animal, some folks do, usually when you hang an animal, before you hang that animal, you actually take the hide off the animal. So that's done before you store your animal in cold storage. You wouldn't do it with the hide on it to begin with. So, but you may not be able to cut it up that day 
uh, if you're taking it, if you're not in a safe area, if it's nighttime and you want to take it back to your barn where you can use a, a winch to hang it up, um, it may not be uh, applicable to even do it close by. So you have to remove it from the premises. Okay, I understand all that. You know, I've actually done it a few times, but um, what I, what I'm not understanding is here. I think you just answered. You only have five days to five days according to the bill. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Wheeler. Uh, we'll go on to our next question. I believe we have Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair. You're right. I, I do have a question now, or a couple. Um, thank you for, for the bill, and thank you for being here. Um, I have a couple of questions. I am a little concerned about my dear friend, Jeff Dixon, that's going to be here for the next bill presentation as he's listening to this, I'm sure. This is very traumatizing. <laughs> so we'll see you soon, Jeff. Um, regarding the, the salvage permit, uh, for those who don't know, when you have a regular deer tag or antelope tag or other wildlife tags, um, you're kind of working in tandem with the Department of Wildlife and you report back certain information once you have your, you've harvested, harvested your animal. So, I'm assuming the salvage permit, you, that data gets reported to NDAO. It, does it get counted in the tag counts? You know, that we hunters provide, you know, this information so NDAO can track how old the animal is, the area the animals are. That, that this is one of the mechanisms they help keep track of the herds and, and other populations. So I'm assuming the salvage permit does that. trying to unmute sorry yes that is the intent and that's why um endow is involved um and my my colleague is can of course speak to this as well but i just did want to put on the record as well i am a huge animal lover i have never shot an animal in my life i have never luckily hit an animal in my life and i hope never to but this is really the humane thing to do i mean if the animal has given up its life i i think that even uh, even I'm not gonna say PETA members, I think that's a bridge too far, but I think animal lovers would would respect that we're, we're at least the life is not lost in vain. So, um, but Assemblywoman Titus, did you wanna add anything? Sure, thank you. So under section one, line number two, it explicitly talks about or speaks towards your very question about what information that permit needs to have so that you know, especially, you know, you know, it hit the car, the collision, the type of animal, uh, and those type of things. And so I think that that's important and can be reported for those high incidents um, accidents. I think it's real important that they know where the deer crossings are for, for safety purposes too. So there's in some ways, I think it would be helpful for uh, NDOT to know and for NDAL to know uh, that where these animals are gonna hit as opposed to being out in the middle of nowhere, they just get pulled off the side, side of the road or somebody takes them anyway, or you know they get eaten by like coyotes, those type of things, or animals. How many times have we been down the road where the magpies, we call them the road crew in, in our neck of the woods because they're out there working in the hawks, the birds. I've had patients, I've seen patients actually who left my office one day, driving away from my office. There was a dead animal on the road. An eagle was on that dead animal. She swerved to miss that and got into an accident. So there's lots of good things to get these animals off the road. Um, but as far as having that information then go to appropriate resources, I think that's really part of that whole, that's why the requirement for salvage permit. When you ask the question about the tags, these animals are gonna be hit anyway, so it won't interfere with the tag quotas based on the herd population. Thank you, Chair, just to follow up real quick. Go ahead. Thank you for that. That I was confused on that. So thank you, um, Assemblywoman Titus for that. and. Uh, and then just one, maybe just a suggestion, or may, maybe I'm seeing more into it. Um, in section one, uh, sub three B on line 24, page three, when we talk about ensure that any meat rendered from the salvageable animal is utilized for human consumption, it just seems a little broad to me that, you know, there's certainly, like we talked earlier, there's some meat that's not gonna be edible. And there's some animals, even if it was fully intact and fresh, we just don't eat those like coyotes or something. So is there maybe, do we need to maybe tighten up that we're you know, ensuring that any meat rendered from the salvageable animal will be utilized for human consumption? Just maybe we need to be a little 
more narrow with that perhaps. And again, thank you so much for the bill and appreciate uh, your collaboration. I think the re I think the reason that this that that part of this is in there is that for the very reason that you pointed out that the that we want the animal uh, if you're going to take this animal we want you the intent is to um, use this and not use it for coyote bait in your trap um, and that's why this needs to be something that you would salvageable for for human consumption. This doesn't address the fact that when we and and I when I harvest an animal I do not send it to butcher we deal with it ourselves. Um, and but something that's bloodied, if you have hit an animal or shot an animal, there will be components of those muscles that are literally bloodshot and you will not eat those. So there's not that all components of the meat that you take will be eat and will be able you'll be able to eat. But in the process, the intent is that you're going to take it for human consumption so that you can't then turn around and feed it to your dogs or you can't feed it to use it in your coyote traps. And so that's why that line is in there to make sure that it's, it's but it, does, it has to be brought because we know that all of that meat will not be able to be consumed in the process. Just to clarify, it is against the law ready for live bait in traps. Just so you know. Well, it wouldn't be live bait, it'd be very dead, but it'd be a piece of a carcass in a, in a yeah. All right, thank you. I believe Assemblyman Ellison, you have a very brief follow-up question. Yes, sir. There's two little things. That uh, number one, uh, Robin, what are you guys going to do? You know, uh, antelope has to be tucked in ice right away because the meat spoiled pretty quick. Um, is that something you want to take into consideration? Because I don't eat antelope or never have, but everybody I talk to says that if you don't pack them in ice, it uh, they get really bad. And then the other thing is, uh, I think this is a great bill and uh, uh, Ms. Bill Ray, if you'd add my name to it, I'd appreciate that. So to answer your first question, cause I can't answer the question for her, uh, but I, I will tell you, John, uh, Assemblyman Ellison, that I we love animals, it's our favorite meat. And the key is that when you do harvest the animal, you have to chill it down. So again, we would hope that, and that's one of the reasons we had discussions about whether you can you, you can harvest at nighttime or whether it, we're worried about the temperature in August or any time of year, because you can't harvest these animals. It is a waste and it, the meat is not very good. So again, the person has who's choosing to harvest this is gonna have to have some good choice. Not everybody will be able to do that. Who has a cooler in the back of their truck, right? So, I mean, this bill allows for the person, if appropriate, to harvest the animal and, and it won't solve all the problems. Not all animals will be able to be harvested. Not all meat will be edible. Um, and again, those very issues that you point out are, are things that are gonna have to be the judgment of the person stopping and say, hey, I just saw this animal hit. I can get this cool. I'm only five minutes away from Lovelock because that's where you're gonna hit it. And you can get back and you can cool the animal down. But again, um, there's gonna be a lot of, of discretion on whether it's appropriate to harvest the animal. And it's something that we just can't write into legislation. Thanks for that. Mr. Ellison, do you have any, anything else? Did the bill, that was all right, Ms. Uh, bill Ray. Um, so this is kind of silly and maybe I'll get over it, but I kind of liked it that it was assembly woman and the minute you put a man on it, it becomes assembly man. And so we <laughs> changed that. That's why I did that. So, but I'll have a conversation with you, Mr. Ellison. Uh, okay. Right. It, it's a good bill. I just wanted you to know. Thank that. you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for members? Seeing none, uh, I will open up testimony on Assembly Bill 299. We'll begin with testimony and support. And before we go to the phones, I wanted to offer um, Mr. Ricker, if there are any additional remarks you want to provide. Thank you, Chair Watts. Uh, the only thing that I'd like to uh, reiterate is um, with the um, provision of um, giving the, the head, hide, and antlers to Indow or submitting those to an Indow office, um, we are um, really ramping up our ability to, to test for wildlife disease throughout the state of Nevada. 
that that would be all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll go on to uh, testimony in support uh, by phone. Broadcast Production Services. Can you see if we have anybody in the queue wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 299? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Assembly Bill 299, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits 732, please press star six to unmute. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 732. Please press star six to unmute and begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Kyle Davis, K-Y-L-E-D-A-V-I-S. And I appear today on behalf of the Nevada Conservation League. The Nevada Conservation League is in support of AB 299. Sadly, wildlife vehicle collisions are a fact of life on remote Western highways. Our state has made significant progress on wildlife crossings and other strategies to reduce these accidents, but they still do happen. AB 299 is an opportunity to avoid wasting the edible portions of game animals that are killed in these collisions. We urge the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Davis. We'll go on to the next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits, 675. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Rebecca Stetson, R-E-B-E-K-A-H-S-T-E-T-S-O-N. Um, Mr. Chair Watson Committee, thank you for your time and listening to my testimony today. I serve on the Governor's Council for Food Security, and although I'm not representing them today, I'm representing the Northern Nevada Food Security Council. And I fully support this bill. I'm super thankful for the folks who brought it forward and for Mr. Ricker for bringing it forward. We have a food insecurity um, problem in Nevada, and this is a beautiful way for folks to be able to really take advantage of perhaps one of the most prime food sources that someone could take. And as I was looking the other day at how many animals are hit um, in vehicle accidents, there's a huge potential for folks to be able to um, to harvest if there is an accident. So again, in support and thank you all for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Stetson. We'll move on to the next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you very much. We'll move on to testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 299. To testify in opposition, on Assembly Bill 299, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 600. Please press star six to unmute. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Assembly uh, Natural Resource Committee, my name is Larry Johnson. I actually signed up to support this bill, but for some reason uh, my star nine didn't, didn't register apparently. So I, I still want to um, um, uh, testify in favor. Um, That's okay. My name is Larry Please go Johnson. Ahead, Mr. Johnson. Uh, uh, my name is Larry Johnson, J-O-H-N-S-O-N, and I want to thank Chair Watson, members of the Na Assembly Natural Resource Committee, for this opportunity to testify in favor of AB 299. Uh, vehicle and wildlife collisions occur hundreds of times each year. Uh, this results in the wanton waste of tons of high-protein, healthy meat. Uh, this bill mirrors uh, what is currently legal in all of the surrounding states, which has uh, developed years of successful performance records dispelling any of the potential opposition points that uh, there could be unhealthy use of this meat. Uh, this has simply not been a problem or any opposition that could be an imposition to endow enforcement employees. Um, as always, there is a common sense component to this proposal. 
Uh, we urge your support of AB 299 and want to thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Mr. Johnson. Uh, will the secretary please note that that is testimony in support? We will move back to testimony in opposition of the bill. Once again, we are in opposition on AB 299. If you would like to testify in opposition, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Chair, it seems that there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move on to testimony in neutral. And before I go back to you, Broadcast Protection Services, I'd like, I know we have somebody from NDOT uh, joining us on Zoom. Uh, and so I'd like to offer you the opportunity to provide uh, any comments that you'd like to make. Thank you, Chair Watts. Uh, for the record, my name is Jeff LaRude with NDOT, Acting Deputy Director of Operations and Maintenance. Um, so NDOT's one of the NDOT's, you know, major concerns is safety. And anytime you leave a vehicle on one of our facilities, it's just more dangerous. So um, I'd like to thank Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod and Assemblywoman Titus for meeting with us the other day and actually taking some of our concerns into account and drafting the amendment language. Um, so we appreciate that. Some of the things that we were most concerned with is not on the interstate, and I see that in the draft language, so thank you. Uh, not allowed at night, which um, is in the draft language, but there's a, um, a ca caveat for it if there's a peace officer with sufficient lighting, so appreciate that. Uh, the only other one is the speed limit of the facility. Uh, one of our concerns is when you are on the side of the road, the higher the speed, the more dangerous it is, obviously. So we're really hoping that um, that speed would be maybe topped off at 45 or 55 miles an hour. And I see that at 70 miles an hour. So I just wanted to uh, put that on the record. That is still going to be a concern for NDOT. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. LaRue. Any questions for NDOT? Seeing none, thank you again for your remarks. With that, we'll go back to broadcast production services to see if we have anyone wishing to testify neutral by phone on AB 299. Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on AB 299, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, it seems that there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod to, to offer any closing remarks that she may have. Thank you, committee, so much. And um, I just, I appreciated working with NDOT and I, I totally understand their concerns. And I do feel like we did, um, you know, make this bill, you know, the safest way we could do it. To, to address the 70 miles an hour, I actually, the reason that we landed on that number, we didn't have a speed limit number initially, but I just kept thinking about the loneliest road in America and the fact that you could be on that road and hit an animal and not be able to do anything when the likelihood of seeing another vehicle or being hit by another vehicle is, is the slimmest in the entire country. So that was sort of where we landed on. We, um, and as we've, just as has been brought up by other callers, this hasn't, you know, been an issue in other states. But um, obviously, uh, safety of Nevadans is paramount, and uh, we we think this this bill got there with the intention and still um, doing having safeguards in place. And thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill two ninety nine, and I will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 209, which prohibits the removal or disabling of the claws of a cat under certain circumstances. Assemblywoman Martinez and your co-presenters, uh, please introduce yourself for the record and you may proceed whenever you are ready. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Chair Watts and members of the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources. For the record, I am Susie Martinez representing Assembly District 12 and I am pleased to present Assembly Bill 209 for your consideration. Um, 
With the chair's permission, I will share with you a PowerPoint presentation, um, which all of the committee members should have, it is, and it is also available on Nellis. Yep, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Coming up. Can you can you see the PowerPoint? We cannot. No. One moment. All right, we can see it now. One moment, Chair. So um, the purpose of Assembly Bill 209 is to prohibit the declining of cats, unless it's for medical necessary reasons. Before I can talk about the bill, I think it's important for the committee to understand what decline really is. There's a misconception that decline involves a simple surgery where the cat's nails are removed which is the equivalent to having your fingernails trimmed. The reality, however, includes the surgical amputation of the cat's paws to remove the claws of the animal or the severance of the tendons to the limbs, paws or toes to modify them in such a way that the claws cannot be extended. In other words, it's toe amputation. It would be the equivalent to cutting off a finger at the first knuckle for a human being. This is excruciating pain that affects the cat's physical emotional and psychological well-being for the rest of their lives. To put it in perspective, this is what decline, decline looks like on a cat. On the left side, on the left side is what it would look like on a human being. I think it's important for the committee to understand the implications and effects that decline has on a cat. Again, this is not just a simple procedure. Cats who are declawed endure an incredible amount of pain that makes it difficult for them to walk, stretch, sit down, or even dis defend themselves against other animals. And that is why I'm proposing Assembly Bill 209. Assembly Bill 209 would prohibit the decline of cats for cosmetic, aesthetic, or convenience reasons. There would be an exception if a licensed veterinarian determines that the procedure was necessary to address the physical, medical condition of a cat such as an existing or reoccurring illness, infection, disease, etc. Additionally, there would be a reporting requirement where the licensed veterinarian would submit a report to the Nevada State Board of Veterinarian Medical Examiners describing the purpose of the procedure. The statement would be required before performing the procedure. In the case of an emergency, the licensed veterinarian would still be able to perform the procedure. However, the statement would be required no later than five days after performing the procedure. In terms of civil penalties, the first violation would be no more than $1,000. The second violation would be no more than $1,500. And the third or subsequent violation would be no more than $2,500. Failure to submit a written report to the board would carry a civil penalty of not more than $100 for the first violation, not more than $150 for the second violation, and not more than 250 for the third, third or subsequent violation. These penalties are, are there to make sure that we protect the health and well-being of cats. We want to make sure that this bill is not only enforceable, but also gives the flexibility of veterinarians to declaw a cat in the case of an emergency and that it's for medical necessary reasons. I talked about how declining a cat can severely affect their physical, emotional, and psychological well-being. Opponents will argue that declining a cat for cosmetic, aesthetic, or convenient reasons are necessary to protect human health, especially for Im immunocompromised people. There is no such credible evidence that this is true. In fact, various federal agencies and organizations have advised against declining cats to protect human health. Some of these organizations and agencies include the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the National Institute of Health, and American Association of Feline Practitioners. This concludes my presentation, and I would now like to turn it over to Dr. Jennifer Conrad, the founder and director of the PAW Project, a national nonprofit organization that has done an incredible job in educating the public 
about the painful and crippling effects of cat decline. Please proceed, Dr. Conrad. Thank you very much, Assemblymember Martinez, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for listening to my presentation to me. I am a veterinarian. My name is Jennifer Conrad, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-C-O-N-R-E-D, and I am a veterinarian and the founder and director of the PAW Project, which is the world's largest nonprofit organization dedicated solely to ending decline. We have members uh, throughout the uh, with throughout North America and in Nevada, I uh, wanted to let you know that the a few things about decline from a veterinary perspective. The first one is that our nails grow from skin, but in a cat, the nail actually grows from the bone. And so, in order to uh, remove the claw, one has to remove the bone. So it'd be the equivalent of taking these cigar cutters and cutting this last bone off in every one of my fingers. I, uh, it is one of the most painful routinely performed surgeries in all of veterinary medicine. And yet it's, it's uh, very rarely do uh, veterinarians give proper pain management because that would take uh, months or years to uh, relieve the pain that these, this surgery is causing. Very, uh, the, there are myths that you might hear from the opposition, and I wanted to clarify them very quickly. One is you might hear that there's going to be this massive deluge of cats, a dumping of cats if they can't be declawed. Well, in all of the jurisdictions where we have banned declawing, there has, that has not been the case. And in fact, in uh, every single one of them, they're reporting that they have not had an increase in cats release, uh, relinquished nor have they ha had um, any of anything like it. In fact, they've had the opposite. The claw bands save lives, according to Brenda Barnett, who's the uh, head of LA Animal Services, a Los Angeles band declawing in 2009. And what they have seen is a decrease in the number of cats uh, relinquished. Uh, in Los Angeles, it, the number ended up being 43.3%, which, which is tens of thousands of cats' lives saved. Everywhere there's been a ban, there, there's been no regret, and every city that we know of uh, ha and uh, province, even in Canada, they all ha are really happy that they've banned declawing. The other thing you might hear, as the assembly wo uh, woman mentioned, is that it, there's a reason to declaw cat because it protects human health. Well, that is just not true because declawed cats bite more. It's in the literature. It, they absolutely bite more. And so uh, if you were to call the emergency room and say, hey, I got scratched by my cat, they would say, well, you should wash it and watch it. But if you say I was bitten by my cat, they're very likely to say you have to come in because many uh, people who have been uh, bitten by a cat will have to be admitted to the hospital and have IV antibiotics. Uh, and also I wanted to just quickly address the fact that cat scratch fever is a misnomer. It really, it comes from fleas. And if you can control the fleas, then you can control the disease. The, um, the other thing I wanted you to know is that the shelters and rescues are uh, giving resounding uh, support for this bill. They, they believe that declawing does not save homes they do believe that it does not save lives. And they know that if they uh, get a cat who's declawed, it's going to be harder to find it a home because declawed cats, when they come home from the surgery, which has amputated their, their, the last bone in their toes, um, they go to use the litter box, they go to dig and they say, wow, uh, I'm not using this anymore. Uh, it hurts too much. And they also recognize that they've been robbed of this uh, this primary way of defending themselves and they resort to biting. So if someone was very intolerant of a cat scratching a couch, you can imagine how intolerant they're going to be of a cat not using the litter box and biting. So declawing uh, cats are, it's in the literature that they bite more and that they don't use the litter box. Um, the last thing that you might hear is that declawing is rare and it's not in according to the literature declawing is performed on 20 to 25 percent of american cats so that's one in five one in four that's a lot 
It is not a last resort like the uh, veterinary medical associations like to say, it is not a last resort. And it doesn't matter how it's done. In most cases, uh, declawing is done with a guillotine uh, nail clipper. So it just cuts off the bone. If it's done with a scalpel or a laser, it doesn't matter. The result is the same. It's an amputation of a toe bone. And as veterinarians across the, the country, uh, the PAW Project has united uh, us to say that we would rather not do something wrong for the money. That's how we feel about it. And we're hoping that uh, we can ask you for your yes vote. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Samuel Martinez, is there any additional uh, presentation or remarks or are we ready to move on to questions? Um, I do have Jeff available also from the Humane Society. Jeff, would you like to um, add any words to our presentation? Yes, thank you, Assemblywoman Martinez. This is Jeff Dixon. I'm the Nevada State Director for the Humane Society of the United States. That is Juliet Echo, Foxtrot, Foxtrot, uh, Delta Indigo, X-Ray, Oscar, November. Um, on behalf of our Nevada supporters and all the cats in the state who have given a choice would definitely keep their paws intact. Uh, the Humane Society of the United States enthusiastically urges the enactment of AB 209. Nevada would be the second state to do so, but would join seven Canadian provinces and over 20 countries from Ireland to Israel, Brazil to Belgium, Australia to, Aus Australia to Austria, and prohibit the non-therapeutic procedure colloquially known as DECLAW, but which has been shown by other presenters to be indeed an amputation. Um, the term declaw is, as we often encounter when we're talking about things that uh, humans do that to animals, is a euphemism. Um, the medical Africa effects include pain, infection, tissue necrosis, which is tissue death, lameness, back pain. Uh, removing their claws changes the way a cat's foot meets the ground and cause pain similar to wearing an ill-fitting pair of shoes. There can be also be a regrowth of improperly removed claws, nerve damage, and spurs. And one in five cats have long-term complications from declaw surgery, while 50% have immediate post-surgical complications. And one-third of declawed cats have behavioral problems after declawing. Um, so you know the terrible and irreversible medical and psychological effects on cats. Uh, the legality of non-therapeutic declaw sends the wrong message, we believe, to pet owners that non-therapeutic amputations are an acceptable thing to do to one's animal. It puts some veterinarians in a position to keep their, to, uh, it's a dilemma where they have to decide whether to keep their customer or to keep their cat with the customer um, or decline to perform the procedure. Uh, veterinarians have a, an emotionally difficult job as is, and this law would spare them from that common dilemma. By prohibiting this practice, we send the message that humane solutions are the only way to address these natural behaviors happen to sometimes inconvenience humans. These solutions include trimming, nail caps, designated stratting surfaces, which I can show you my cats here. She's put a very nice uh, divot in her uh, I don't know what it's called, but I got it at Walmart for like $7. Um, and many other solutions that one can easily find on the internet. One can even use the funds that would normally go to, that would go to an operation, to hiring a behavior specialist to consult on the issue. Uh, the continued legality of non-therapeutic declaw undermines the life-saving work, and this is very important, uh, represented by hundreds of thousands of work hours and volunteer hours massive sums of public and donor money done by the animal welfare community in the state. Cats suffer from these procedures psychologically and physically, and that often leads to behavioral adaptations that are even less tolerable to their humans than the ones it was initially intended to prevent or mitigate. If they make it to a shelter, they have a tough time getting out. Claws are a part of the cat's essence, and you cannot simply train their distress, discomfort, and defensiveness out of them. And it takes a patient uh, and knowledgeable person to adopt one of these animals. Um, and they can't just put them outside like a barn cat 
where they are going to be compromised when it comes to hunting and they're going to become more fearful because they don't have their first line of defense. I would like to point you to a coalition that are of animal welfare organizations that are in support. Um, I know there are a lot of exhibits, but it's down toward the bottom, I believe. And it's co-signed by uh, some major organizations which you might recognize. You have Katmandu in Carson City, Heaven Can Wait Animal Society in Las Vegas, Homeward Bound Cat Adoptions in Las Vegas, Humane Network in Reno, PAL and V and Rescue Treasures Cat Cafe in Las Vegas, the SPCA of Northern Nevada in Reno, and the Animal Foundation in Las Vegas, the last of which uh, they serve, um, they are the shelter, the government contracted shelter for about 1.7 million Nevadans. Um, in closing, if you pass this bill, uh, the people on blood thinners will be fine. They're fine in all these other countries. Immunocompromised people will be fine. Veterinarians will be fine, and in some cases relieved. And the animal welfare community will benefit as one of the drivers of surrenders and euthanasias will be discontinued. And most of all, the animals will be spared the prospect of undergoing this life-altering and unnecessary procedure. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Dixon. With that, Assemblywoman Martinez, are we ready to go to questions? Yes, we are ready for questions. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we'll start with a question from Assemblywoman Anderson. Thank you, Chair Watts, and thank you, Assemblymember Martinez, for bringing this forward. Um, as a fellow cat lover, I, I really appreciate this information. Um, my question has to do with section, it has to do with the fines. So that would be in section one, two, basically, it looks like four. Or, I'm sorry, section one, subsection four. Would these fines be over a period of six months of, for the first civil? Second would be over six months, or is it over a year, or is it over a two year period? I guess um, just that little clarification. Um, I would like to defer that question to Mr. Horn. Mr. Horn, are you available? Hello. For the record, my name is William Horn. Strategy 360, representing the PAW project. The fees are in line to be a deterrent uh, for the bad, the bad actors. We know there was some pushback saying that wasn't in line with uh, other fees. But if, if you're talking about the average uh, cost of decline a cat is about $250, you have to set the fee in such a place to where uh, they're not going to do uh, a cosmetic procedure and uh, because the, the fine is so low, uh, they absorb it. So it has to be a deterrent in, in doing so. Follow up if I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I agree with that. Understand that, that the thought process with it for the first violation, it would be $100, but for the second violation of 150, would that be within a, a year or what, how, or would it be for five years later? I guess I'm just asking for that little clarification of the time frame between when the, for lack of a better term, the clock starts ticking. That isn't uh, indicated in the bill. It's certainly something that could be visited. It wouldn't be the first statute uh, that didn't have a timeline in uh, prohibited conduct and it, uh, accelerated uh, fines and penalties involved with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I believe I have a question from Assemblywoman Titus next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question really result, revolves around the veterinary practice and I'm wondering, um, and, and when you had your the veterinarian, um, and I'm sorry, I'm missing her name. I'm not seeing her on the screen right now, so I apologize for that. Um, the, the veterinarian association nationwide, what is their stance on it? I'm not sure I heard you say that. Have they took a taken a professional opinion on decline? The, uh, Jennifer Conrad for the Paul Project. Uh, the professional opinion is that 
decline should only be done as a last resort when all humane alternatives have been exhausted. Uh, unfortunately, the truth of the matter is that 76% of declaws are performed on kittens fewer than eight months old. So wait, so I'm not sure you answered my question. So the, the, the National Association of Veterinary Doctors have, have a position statement on decline? Correct. And it, and it says only for humane purposes? It says declawing should be only performed as a last resort after all the humane alternatives have been exhausted. Okay. And uh, unfortunately, most veterinarians don't adhere to that because declawing is often found in kitten packages. Okay. Is, uh, is, is generally is there's no general anesthesia when this is done? It's done just as you use like a nail clipper, no anesthesia is done when you perform this? No, generally you hope there's anesthesia. Okay. It's often uh, piggybacked onto a spay or neuter uh, so that the client doesn't have to pay for a second anesthesia. So, but the problem with it is that 30% of veterinarians Declawing is so predictably painful, it's used in clinical trials to test pain medication. And yet, according to the literature, 30% of veterinarians are using no pain medication whatsoever because they learn in school that cats are sensitive to pain medications, so they just opt not to use it. Uh, and then back to the presenter, if I might, uh, another question, um, Chair Watts? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so only one other state so far has this um, legislation. Is, is that what I also heard you say? Only one state has passed this and what state is that? That would be New York. My apologies. Go ahead, Dr. Conrad. Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, Jennifer Conrad, Paul Project. Uh, the state of New York, seven Canadian provinces and 11 uh, U.S. cities. And, and so when you say your project and you've been successful, so it's been, is there anything in our current law that would prohibit, um, uh, it sounds like you have cities that have passed ordinances that prohibit this. Is there anything, uh, and maybe legal could tell us, is there anything in current statute that would prohibit a county from um, prohibiting that and maybe left to the locals and what's best for an area versus a state state NRS with fines? Thank you for that question, Assemblywoman Titus. I think this is an appropriate question for Mr. Ambern to speak upon. Thank you, Chair mm -hmm. Watts. Alan Ambern for the record. Um, as far as I know, as of right now, that is, un, it's just unspecified in current statute. Um, we could specify it if we so desired or if the committee so desired. But uh, as far as I'm aware, there's just it's just an undefined uh, aspect of the law right now. Right. So, so right now, nothing prohibits, as other cities, you said, perhaps Los Angeles or some other cities have chosen to say, hey, we're not going to let our veterinarians do this any longer. So what I understand is that only one other state, and that's New York, who's done this. There's nothing prohibits a veterinarian from saying, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. And to a, any local cities, municipalities, they could have their own ordinances that, that pass this law, that have this regulation. Is that correct? Alan Ambern, again, for the record, I believe, again, as far as I'm aware, I believe that they could. Um, of course, if this bill was passed as written, uh, then they would have to comply with statute. Correct. And then the final thing is, um, um, the um, it was mentioned that there is, as a physician, ER again, you guys have heard me say this before, I have taken care of multiple patients with cat, cat scratch disease, had to, you know, treating them with antibiotics. Um, some are hospitalized. We know that I have an estimated 12,000 outpatients and 500 inpatients are diagnosed with cat scratch disease annually. The veterinarian testified that, um, and I, I didn't, have not been able to see that data, that a declawed cat bites more um, and so I'm not, I'm not sure where that, that is great to see whatever study that showed, but I'm concerned about from, it says in this chapter that for the cat's reason, um, you could not, you, you could do it for uncertain situation for the cat. And then you testified that there was never a reason for it to be done if 
uh, a person has a cat that because of immune deficiencies or whatever, there's no indication that um, it prevents disease. However, um, I, I'm not see, I'm, I'm seeing it differently. I'm seeing that there is potential in cat scratch, especially we saw some, I saw some data between kids, especially children five to nine years old tend to get scratched and bitten by cats. We know the risk of, of how, how often um, they might get an infection from that. And I'm, I'm worried about in certain special situations uh, uh, where um, somebody wants to have a, a cat and we know you have to be responsible for pet ownership. We know that um, that cat cannot survive outside. We know that as somebody mentioned, it couldn't be a barn cat. In certain special situations, it doesn't really allow for an application that I, you know, could be surveyed and say in this situation, that person probably would be good. Maybe they shouldn't be a pet owner. I agree. Maybe if, you know, they couldn't take the risk of being bitten, but I just have concerns when it's a blanket, you can never do this in certain situations it may be appropriate. So um, I'm wondering if there's, if the New York law banned it entirely and never allowing for certain situations. And Mr. Chairman, um, may I chime in? So, Go ahead, Horn. Mr. Horn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, uh, William Horn with Strategies 360. I, uh, to portion to Dr. Titus's uh, uh, concerns on medical reasons. Uh, an article from the uh, see, the American Veterinary um, Medical Association and Java News, uh, when addressing what the standard of care is in and doing these procedures. And one of the concerns on whether or not um, disease health of their owners, the pet owners, uh, was not of concern. And in fact, they note that even the Center for Disease Control and Prevention uh, doesn't list decline among potential means for preventing uh, disease in humans. And, and this right. article is from uh, March uh, 2020. Last yeah, year. I saw, I, I did actually look at that, but it doesn't recommend decline, but it doesn't say that. Um, Interesting enough, it may or may not help, but they did use the term clipping the claws, shortening the claws. They used the term having you know claw things. So yes, appreciate that, um, but it still didn't mean that it, it, it may not have helped. So anyway, I appreciate the questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Assemblywoman. I believe we have a question from Assemblywoman Hansen. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity, and thank you all for being here. Um, I've certainly appreciated the the, uh, the education, the information. I, I own two cats; they're not declawed. Um, I want to visit this idea of pain in animals, in particular, well, with cats. But you know, we're dealing with it in our own home. We have a 14-year-old pug, and I'm always wondering how am I going to know? And I've got some good direction, but so. When we talk about the decline procedure and then the pain of it, I'm, I'm curious, how do, we, how do we know what the levels of pain are? Because uh, we can't communicate per se with them. And then I'm thinking about that in light of spaying and neutering. Certainly those are painful procedures. Um, so are we saying that the cats are in pain continually? Where with spay and neuter, Hopefully, it's just pain for a surgery to recover from. So I'm not understanding if if the the issue with the pain on the decline is long term. May I answer for the for the doctor? Go ahead, yeah. Ms. Conrad. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer Conrad, Paul Project. Um, what we know is that declawing is so predictably painful that it's used in, in um, uh, clinical trials. We also know that there are ways to assess pain in cats. There are more and more ways, and they have to do with facial grimaces and how the ears are held and how the whiskers are held. And what the pain textbooks say is that declawing is severe pain, spay is moderate pain, and neuter is mild pain according to the way the animal's uh, facial expression changes. We also know that there's a study where declawed cats, where they declawed one paw on a cat and then they had them walk on a force plate 
so that they could tell how they shifted the weight uh, in order to avoid putting pressure on the paw. And the study only lasted tw for 12 days, but the cats were still limping on that paw after 12 days. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about. It seems like it's there's uh, a lot of indication that there's chronic pain involved. And the literature says that 20% of cats will have um, a, a permanent surgical complication and 50% will have immediate surgical complications. So we, we know that it's a painful surgery. The difference between spay and neuter, A, spay and neuter is soft tissue so that it, it, it doesn't hurt as much as an actual uh, orthopedic procedure. And the obvious other difference is that spay and neuter actually helps animals and declawing actually hurts animals in, in the sense that they lose their homes because they've been declawed or, or they are in permanent pain. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe we have a question from Assemblywoman Brown May and I just asked uh, our members and uh, presenters to please be brief in your questions and responses. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a question relative to um, the frequency of this procedure happening in urban areas versus rural. As we listen to uh, Assemblywoman uh, uh, Dr. Titus talk about uh, her having cats and in a rural setting, I'm wondering if, the, if we would see this procedure more in an urban setting as a result of an indoor cat as opposed to an indoor outdoor cat. Jeff, would you, would you, can you help us with that? I don't know of any numbers. I can ask our, our policy specialist and get back with you if I find anything, something woman. Oh, sorry, this is Jeff Dixon for the record. Great, thank you. Any other questions for our presenters? Seeing none, I will now open testimony on Assembly Bill 209. For the sake of time, I'm gonna limit testimony for, uh, for support, opposition and neutral to 20 minutes in each position. And uh, again, we are going to ask each speaker to limit their remarks to two minutes. So with that, I'll turn it over to Broadcast Production Services uh, to see if we have anybody wishing to provide testimony in support of Assembly Bill 209. Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on AB 209, please press star nine now to enter the queue. Caller with the last three digits 230. Please press star six to unmute. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, and thank you, Assemblywoman Martinez, for bringing this bill to the legislature. My name is Kelly Bolin. I'm a certified animal behavior consultant here in Nevada. I'm speaking in support of the bill AB 209, the ban on decline cats. I've consulted with cat owners for over 20 years to help resolve behavioral issues. A substantial number of my cases involve unwanted behaviors that resulted from declaw procedure. These behavioral challenges include loss of litter box use, increased emotional, emotional sensitivity, fear, and irritability, and an increase in aggressive behavior towards humans and other pets. In most cases, these behavioral issues stem from chronic pain that many declawed cats suffer from. When a declawed cat becomes aggressive, they often resort to biting because they no longer have their first line of defense weaponry, their claws, making them more dangerous to people when they are afraid and feel the need to lash out in defense. I've also consulted with animal shelters over the past 20 years and every shelter in the United States, including these here, those here in Nevada with whom I have worked, received declawed cats surrendered by their owner because of unwanted behavior stemming from declawing. As a behavior, the thought of using an invasive surgical intervention to solve a manageable behavior is excessive and inhumane. All of the behaviors that lead to the desire for decline can be solved with behavioral intervention. I'm very hopeful that Nevada votes to ban this cruel practice. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for your testimony. We'll go on to the next caller in support.
caller with the last three digits, 983. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Karen, C-A-R-O-N. Last name is Taylo, T-A-Y-L-O-E. I'm a Washer County resident. I want to thank the sponsors of AB 209, and I am speaking in support of AB 209. For over 18 years, my family and I fostered cats for one of the large shelters uh, located in northern Nevada. And we have had extensive experience caring for cats, including those that had been declawed and then abandoned by their owners. Uh, we attended to many declawed cats, um, most of whom had permanent post-surgery injuries and abnormalities from the declawing process. Uh, some were declawed cats um, that were abandoned uh, to the outside to fend for themselves. There's absolutely no reason to declaw a cat. There are dozens of effective and humane methods to address the scratching of household items and furniture. These methods are easily researched and obtained, and I would recommend that pet owners consult with their veterinary professionals regarding these better methods. Please support AB 209, and thank you once again to the sponsors, and thank you for hearing this important bill. Thank you very much for your testimony. We'll move on to the next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits, 886. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. My name is Alexandra Noriega, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A-N-O-R-I-E-G-A. -E -E I want to thank you for your time and thank the sponsors in support of this bill. I have fostered cats in Las Vegas for the last five years. I've had about 100 cats and kittens come in and out of my home. Um, there are plenty of cats that are already declawed in the shelter if that is an issue with children in the home or elderly people worried about getting bitten or excuse me, clawed possibly. There are plenty of shelters to pick from <clears throat> that have declawed cats. Um, cats that have been declawed are in a separate room because their only defense, form of defense is taken away. So they have to be put into a separate room in these shelters because they are um, defenseless, essentially. It's an archaic practice, and cats can be trained to claw on specific um, items of furniture designed specifically for them. I have trained my cat to claw on um, scratching posts, and we have cat posts all over the house, and they know they know that this is their safe spot to claw, claw on. Excuse me. Um, so I am in full support of this bill, and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We'll go on to the next caller. Caller with the last three digits, 401. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Hi, my name is Abrakowanta, A-B-R-A-K-W-O-U-B-A-N-T-E. Thank you, Assemblywoman Martinez, for bringing this important piece of legislation forward. Cats who are declawed endure an immense amount of pain, making it difficult for them to do basic actions, such as walking, stretching, even defending themselves against other animals. Declawing brings in long-term effects like back pain and serious infection due to possible shattered bones from the surgical nail carter. Declawing is inhumane, not ethical, and that is why AB 209 has my full support. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, with that, we'll go on to the next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits, 613. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes. May begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Rebecca Goff, R-E-B-E, -E, C as in cat, C as in cat, A, G as in girl, O, S as in Frank, F as in Frank. I'm the clinic manager at the Nevada Humane Society in Reno, and I have worked in veterinary medicine for over a decade. I'm here today speaking in support of this bill as a representative of the Nevada Humane Society. As Nevada's only open admission no-kill shelter, we see firsthand some of the negative effects of decline cats, including, but not limited to, many of these cats being surrendered to the shelter as a result of some of the physical and behavioral complications they experience after the trauma of being declawed. We also understand that there will be some cases where medical, for medical reasons, decline is being necessary by a cat's vet. 
and we appreciate that this bill addresses that as well. We thank the sponsor of the bill for bringing this important issue to our state's attention, and we urge the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the next caller and support. Caller with the last three digits, 313. Please press star six to unmute. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes, maybe begin. Hi, my name is Rodas Baruk, R-O-D-A-S-B-I-R-U-K. Thank you, Assemblywoman Martinez, for bringing this important piece of legislation forward. AB 209 has my full and strong support because declawing is unethical, unnecessary, and a cruel practice that has the potential to damage a cat's well-being for the rest of its life. Cats need their claws to do numerous things, such as gripping items like furniture so they don't fall and slip, and even self-defense. It wouldn't be right for such a major part of them to be taken away. In addition, by taking away their claws, cats could also begin utilizing more harmful behavior towards humans. It's for the overall safety and health of both cats and humans that I stand by this bill. Thank you for taking the time to hear this out. Thank you very much for providing your testimony. We'll go on to the next caller in support. Caller with the last three digits, 947. Please press star six to unmute. Please totally state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 947. Please press star six to unmute and begin. Hi, my name is Haley Gorlo, H-A-I-L-E-Y-G-O-R-E-L-O-W, and I am in support of Bill AB-209 because declawing cats is equivalent to amputating human fingers at the third knuckle, and the NIH CDC Public Health Service and Infectious Disease, Disease Society of America has specifically stated that declawing cats is not advised even for persons who are severely immunocompromised. All right, thank you, Ms. Gorlo, for your testimony. We'll move on to the next caller in support. Chair, I believe that was the last caller in support at this time. Thank you. With that, uh, we'll move on to testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 209. To testify in opposition on AB 209, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to testimony in neutral on Assembly Bill 209. To testify in neutral on Assembly Bill 209, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, it seems that there are no colors in neutral at this time. All right, I went quickly. That I'll close testimony and turn it back over to Assemblywoman Martinez for any closing remarks she'd like to make. Thank you, Chair Watts. Um, as we were speaking on the previous bill, um, I heard one of the words that was mentioned a few times about humanity, about being humane to the animals. Well, this can trickle down to this bill as well. Uh, we need to be humane to these animals. What, what they do to their to their to their paws, it's so archaic. Um, you know, I once heard a uh, Angela, Angel, um, Maya Angelou once said, you know, that when we know better, we do better. So um, I also wanted to emphasize that um, I have tremendous amount of respect for veterinarians. They do an incredible job in making sure that our animals are taken care of. And in many cases, they treat them as if they were their own. This bill isn't to target veterinarians. It's a bill to target cruel, inhumane, and an unethical practice of decline cats, of stripping them of their identity, of their ability to defend themselves and their ability to simply walk, play, and enjoy the beauties that life has to offer. 
So thank you, Chairman. Chair, um, thank you, Chair Watts and members of the committee for allowing me to present this bill. Um, I urge you to support Assembly Bill 209 and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Assemblywoman Martinez. With that, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 209. And I believe that takes us to the final item on our agenda for today, uh, which is public comment. As a reminder, provide public comment. You must register in advance on the legislature's website where you'll be given call-in information. We ask that uh, anybody providing public comment limit their remarks to two minutes. And I'll turn it over to BPS to see if we have anybody in the queue wishing to provide public comment. Thank you, Chair. To take part in the public comment queue, please press star nine now. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. All right, thank you very much, Broadcast Production Services, for your assistance in uh, allowing members of the public and others to participate in our meeting today. Thank you, members, for your time, attention, and questions. And uh, thanks to all of those who joined us to provide your insights onto the bills that were heard today. Uh, members, uh, as an informational item, we will be uh, scheduling a meeting for Friday, the 9th of next week. Uh, that will be to handle work session items. So I just wanted to give everyone uh, a heads up uh, for planning purposes on that. Um, and I believe with that, we are, we are done prior to six o'clock. Uh, good job, everyone. Our next meeting will be on Monday, which is April 5th at 4 p.m. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. Thanks.